So in C and C++, you probably spend a lot of time thinking about memory allocation, but there might be cases where you want to think about those same things in .NET. So if you want to learn more, there is a really cool profiling tool called the .NET Allocation Tool, which we're going to learn more about on this profiling episode of Visual Studio Toolbox. Hey everyone, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Leslie Richardson. And once again, I am joined by Sagar Shetty, who's a PM on the Visual Studio Diagnostics team. Hey, hey Sagar, how's it going? Good, Leslie. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So once again, we are back for another episode of our profiling series. And what are we going to talk about today? Yeah, so we're going to go through another deep dive for another tool within the Performance Profiler in Visual Studio. And today we're going to talk about the .NET Object Allocation Tracking Tool. A bit of a mouthful, but it's <laughs> one of two memory profilers uh, in the Performance Profiler suite. And it's basically designed to show you kind of the top functions, the code pathways, and the different types that are allocating the most amount of memory in your code. Cool. I don't know if you ever simplify that down to note. <laughs> no <ads>. yeah. <laughs> yeah, normally we just call it like the .NET alloc tool internally, and that's short enough, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that sounds good. Cool. <laughs> cool. So usually when I think about memory allocation or just allocating anything, I typically think of like C or C++ where you have to do all that manually. But in .NET, usually there's like the garbage collector who takes care of all that stuff for you. So why have the .NET allocation tool? Yeah, so garbage collection, that's definitely a great point, Leslie. And especially with .NET, it's gotten to a point where there is the garbage collector that, like you said, does a lot of that uh, memory management automatically. That being said, um, you know, profiling at a high level is about getting the optimizations that you want to like the highest degree. So even though garbage collection can help you with a little bit of that memory collection, there are still optimizations to be had based on the way that you write your code. And, and hopefully using our tool, we can help surface some of those optimizations that you can do on top of garbage collection. Yeah, so can you describe a little bit about what those specific use cases would be for a .NET user who might want to use yeah, this tool? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the, the easiest way to explain is to kind of jump right in. So let's kind of go into VS and then start looking at some of the views. And I think some of those scenarios will become more apparent. Awesome. So kind of going into VS, so again, just like all the other tools um, to kind of get into the performance profiler, it's the same workflow. You go to the context menu, you can go to debug and then performance profiler or just use the keyboard shortcut Alt F2. So then we get to this page. And to give a little bit more of a uh, background with this particular tool, so today we're talking about the .NET Alloc tool, so I have this box checkmarked. Um, so this tool is going to be good for really any sort of managed scenario or managed application. So it's good for all flavors of .NET, so framework, um, .NET Core, ASP.NET, et cetera. What's Not your so framework much. too? Yeah, yeah, so all wow. flavors of .NET, yeah. So it really is a, a managed, a pretty comprehensive tool in that regard. Um, for native, you're probably you're not going to use this tool. Um, just based on the way it's architected, it uses the iCore profiler, which is kind of the profiling interface for the .NET runtime. So it really is a, more of a managed experience. Is, and there a another, similar, oh, go ahead. Oh, is there a similar tool for C++ users that they can use? Yeah, so on the C++ side and for memory analysis on the native side, you're going to end up using uh, the memory usage tool. Now, these two tools aren't exactly alike, um, but, but that will give you some insights in terms of where your code is spending a lot of time from a memory perspective. And so kind of going back to the Donna Alec tool, another thing I'd like to call out is um, in this particular settings window, so if I click on this gear icon, uh, we come to this particular window. Now, in the past, we've talked about uh, a few different data collection methods. And uh, when Esteban was talking about the CPU usage tool, for example, something we talked about was kind of sampling, um, which essentially was a data collection technique where we were taking snapshots of the performance data in our in our code and kind of stitching that together. The .NET Alloc tool, on the other hand, uses a slightly, you can use sampling if you want, like you can switch it over to this, but by default, it uses a slightly different data collection technique called instrumentation. And instrumentation is essentially, if you think of uh, snapshots and sampling as kind of taking pictures and stitching that together, instrumentation is kind of like a video. It, it really is much more detailed and is giving you exact call counts and, a, and like very fine tuned and precise and accurate data. Um, so that's cool because you can get exact call counts um, and, and we'll see some of those values in the example today. I will say, and one thing I, I will caution users using this tool is that as a result, this data collection technique has a, a pretty high overhead. 
And so to kind of counteract that, one recommendation I'd have is to keep traces as short as possible. Cool. Um, and I will kind of reiterate this at the end of the video, but performance is definitely something we're working on with this tool in terms of improving it and speeding it up. I can assure you, this is something our engineering team is very hard at work for, but yeah, in general, just as far as best practices, keeping traces short um, would probably be something I'd recommend with this tool if you want to use instrumentation. So what is the default set to like frame wise or however you measure um, how much or how little gets tracked? Yeah, so um, you're going to look at, um, with this tool, it's going to literally track every single object allocated. Um, so as we'll see once we kind of run the tool and go into the views, it, it will kind of look at different um, object allocation types. And for each different object type in your code, it will show you how many objects were created and how much memory that total is, is taking up. And so by default, the instrumentation is tracking all of them and, and grabbing all of those objects. And, and it's measured on an object level. Um, yeah. Sweet. Well, I'd like to see it in action. Yeah, yeah. So I'm uh, going to close out that window. Um, I have an app loaded up. And I'm going to go ahead and click Start and start the profiling session. So the app we have today is actually a WinForms app. And this app is essentially what it's doing is helping us visualize prime numbers. So it's, it's a pretty simple app. You have a minimum value, a maximum value. And for each of those values, an ellipse is created. And each um, ellipse, it corresponds to like a specific number. And for numbers that are prime, they're indicated by like a green icon. And for numbers that aren't, it's yellow. And so we'll kind of exercise this a few times. Click Stop. Um, and this app does quite a lot of memory allocation. So it, it's a good way to show off this particular tool. In this case, is a object being created for each number or each dot? That was on the screen there, or yeah. So we're, we're gonna dig into the source code a bit more, but for each ellipse that's creating, and in this case, an ellipse object. So we're using an mm -hmm. ellipse class, and so there will be an ellipse object being created, and so yeah, a lot of memory is being allocated. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, a lot. Ramp that max up to ten million. Exactly. Okay, awesome. So now we're kind of looking at the report generated by the Don and Alec tool, and so there's a couple of views here. So the first thing I want to point at are kind of the graphs at the top of the screen. So at the, the like the highest graph, we have live objects. So um, these objects are just a total count of the live number of objects that are allocating memory within your code. This is objects across all different types. And in some of the views, when we drill down to the tables, we can kind of look at and categorize objects by specific type. But this graph is just kind of showing an all up total count measurement. Um, so that's kind of live objects. Mm -hmm. And then the second graph is the object delta, so the chain. So this is showing anytime you have like large spikes in, in objects. And then as we kind of alluded to earlier, Leslie, with garbage collection, kind of cleaning up and reclaiming some memory, you have these red bars every once in a while. And so the red bars are actually indicating where garbage collection is occurring in your code. Um, so in general, you can think of it where green bars are just kind of adding on more and more objects. And at the beginning, you'll see large deltas because just the way the math works out, right? When you don't have too many, yeah, exactly. When you're initializing and you don't have many objects to begin with, even adding a few more objects percentage-wise, because this is on a percentage basis is a lot. Um, over time, it tends to, to dip a little bit. But um, the really important thing with these graphs or swim lanes, as we call them within the performance profiler, is uh, you can time select and filter down by that. So for example, I can select a range on this graph. And what that will do is filter down the data in my tables by that time range I selected. So if I was really interested in a bit of garbage collection here or some area where there was a lot of app activity, I could filter down and then look at um, specific time ranges and really dig deeper for that specific time range. Um, and another thing I'll point out, and this isn't as applicable for this tool, but just to reiterate, when you're running multiple of our tools in conjunction with each other, we will stick swim lanes at the top if, if you're using a tool such as the CPU usage tool that has a swim lane. And if you're running multiple tools in conjunction with each other and you want to filter by the same time range across all tools, if you do do the filtering at the top for all the tools and all the reports, it will filter by that time range too. So um, with this tool, you're genera generally running it by itself because of the high overhead, but I just wanted to kind of call that out again. Mm -hmm. So those are kind of the graphs. And I'm just going to clear the time selection for now, just so we look at everything all up. And now we dig into the tables, where there's, I think, a lot of insights. So yeah. um, generally, you start the inv There's a few different ways um, that you can kind of start your investigation. For today, I'll kind of start with the allocations view. 
Um, and so the allocations view is essentially showing you a bunch of different object types or, or classes or structures within your code. So there's a very long list here. Um, and so like ellipse is kind of bubbled up to the top. And for each one of these types, we're showing you um, the number of allocations. So this is the number of, in this case, ellipses um, or, or objects, create, uh, objects of that type created within your code. Um, for the, furthermore, in addition to just the number of allocations of that type, we're showing you the actual amount of memory that's being taken up. So that's what the bytes column is showing you across all of those allocations. And then also average size. So that's just uh, the division between bytes and allocations. Uh, wow. So, uh, I mean, <laughs> it looks like a lot of allocations going on for pretty much all of these. Yeah. And so we'll dig into ellipse a little bit more in the source code in a second. But one more thing I want to talk about as far as the types is generally they fall into two kind of categories and two subcategories. So the two main categories are value types and reference types. And actually, if you notice, this is something we, we've kind of modified over the last years. We've actually added in icons into this particular view. So um, this blue icon over here indicates a value type. And this yellow one indicates uh, more of a reference type. So what those are. So value types are things like, as we see here, a double or an integer or a Boolean even. So what value types are, so if you think of an example, so I said like an integer, for example, is a value type. Whenever you create a variable of a type of a value type, such as an integer, what happens is um, a specific uh, memory address is kind of pointed out, and that's where the variable is initialized and stored. And in the case of a value type, the value of that variable and that variable exist at the same memory location. In the case of the reference type, things work a little bit differently. So a reference type are things like strings, uh, classes are reference types, arrays are reference types. Um, and in the case of a reference type, where a variable exists and where its value exists are actually two separate spots. So a string might be initialized at a specific memory address, and then its actual value, the contents of the string, are at a slightly different memory address. So at the um, memory address where the variable is stored, it actually also contains a pointer to the place where um, the value is stored. And the reason why th this is important, um, Leslie, is because of how um, these two, two types are stored in memory within like the .NET runtime. So if we think about our memory, it's essentially kind of like a physical block, right? There, there is a limited amount of finite, it's a finite resource. There's a limited amount of space we have to kind of store data and allocate memory. And within that memory, um, the way it's kind of managed in .NET is there's at a high level, two partitions. There's the stack and the heap. So the stack is generally um, a partition where things that are, are more short term are stored, kind of local variables, things of that nature. And the heap is a partition where more long-term um, objects are stored in general. It's, it's more objects and things of that nature, things that are more long-lived. So this is kind of like uh, oversimplified and more high level, but that just kind of gives you a sense of where those two things are stored. And the reason this is important is um, even though uh, value types are stored on the stack, sometimes if they're cast to, so like if you have an integer and you cast it to an object, that actually becomes a reference type. So then it ends up being stored on the heap as well. So now you have a value type that's taking up memory on the stack and the heap. So in other words, it's taking up twice as much memory. Um, so you kind of have to be on the lookout for value types. And that's kind of why we surface them with these icons here. Um, so yeah, we have value types, you have reference types. Also, if we go back and look at this back trace, you may notice, I kind of mentioned that there are two kind of subtypes. Mm -hmm. There are also these kind of blue icons with these like buckets under them. And also we have like the yellow icons with the buckets under them as well. So that in that case, those are value type collections and reference type collections. So again, like the blue icon is the value type. So this bucket is showing a collection. And then the yellow one with the bucket is showing a collection as well. So that, that's essentially just taking a value type and showing a collection of it. So in this case, um, this, this type is effective value entry. And then it's like a list of that type. Um, and then in this case, um, like here, we have like system.object and it's like a, a list or like an array of objects or a collection of objects. So that's kind of what those icons are showing. So anyway, that's a bit of a tangent backstory on different types, just thought I'd go into that. But kind of getting back into the code a little bit. Um, so we noticed before, right now we have this sorted by bytes. And so whatever has the highest number of bytes bubbles up to the top. So this is taking up a lot of memory. And um, what if we wanted to like investigate this a little bit more and see kind of what's happening in our code here? So if you double click on um, this line, 
What we show you in this right panel, and let me modify this window a bit, is a backtrace. Okay, so after we kind of click, click on this uh, ellip ellipse type, we want to look through the backtrace and kind of see uh, where in the code it's being allocated a lot. And so we sort of see this generate primes function allocating a lot of memory and a lot of bytes. So now what I want to do is ultimately go back to source code and see if there's any sort of modifications that can be done uh, to kind of optimize this. So I can right click and hit go to source file. And in this case, I have the uh, code up. And so we kind of come to this generate primes function. Cool. So I'm a little surprised because uh, in some of the previous tools that we talked about in past episodes, like the CPU usage tool and uh, I think memory tool, database tool, they all had like hot path uh, function tables, like with little fire icons that indicated yep. here are the functions that you should consider honing in on because they're hot spots for all the CPU usage or memory perf issues, that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. And we'll actually touch on that again with this tool. In fact, just a sneak peek, uh, we kind of have that same functionality in the call trees window. And so we'll talk about that a little bit later and kind of here it is. Um, but yeah, we'll come back to that. And for now, we'll keep going to the allocations view. But yeah, definitely the expand the hot path is definitely a useful feature. And, and we do preserve it in this tool as well. Cool. And so uh, now, Leslie, we're kind of looking back at some source code and trying to see where we can optimize and see why Ellipse is allocating so much memory. So we have this generate primes function. Uh, we kind of have these, these long values, the min and max that we saw in the application before. And if we kind of scroll through here, we see we have a for loop going from min to max. And within this for loop, we have an ellipse, which is, in this case, uh, a class. And so we're creating a new ellipse object for each different iteration of this for loop. And so that's why when we had Oof. that application before, <laughs> that is a lot of ellipses, right? Yeah. And so one thing I will point out here is based on the nature of this particular application and this visualization, even though we are allocating a lot of memory towards ellipses, for this visualization, we, we actually do want each of those ellipses, right? Because we wanted an ellipse printed out or, or shown right. uh, for each number. So yes. Um, it is taking up a lot of memory, but you just kind of have to think about, is this an actual bottleneck or um, are you willing to live with this? Because um, if we were to want to improve this, for example, right, there's only so much we can do to get around this particular um, issue based on the way we've currently implemented this code. Right now, yes, even though we are creating a new ellipse for each iteration of the for loop, we actually want to do that um, and paint it a specific color um, based on whether it's a prime number or not. If we wanted to not have to use an ellipse, we'd have to really think about how to kind of instruct this code very differently. And so um, it might not be very easy to do that. We probably wouldn't use an ellipse class seeing as um, the height and the width are the same. Maybe we use like a circle or something different. Um, and so even though we can fix this or optimize that, that's not what I want to focus on for this particular demo, because ultimately it might be a bit more involved. A question I might have instead though, is you know this function seems to be getting a lot of bandwidth and doing a lot of work. And yes, there's a lot of type ellipse being uh, allocated and created. But are there other types within this exact same function that are also being allocated a lot? And is there another um, optimization to be had? And so to kind of like answer that question, I kind of want to go over to another one of our views within the, the diag session. So the first thing I want to do is actually copy this function because I want to investigate this function more. And the question I want to ask myself now is, not so much like what are the top types being allocated but for a specific function, in particular that function I was just looking at, what are the top types that that function is allocating? And actually we have a functions view that can help you do just that. So this is the functions view, um, kind of showing you similar data to what we were looking at before, but just grouped differently and, and kind of um, visualized a bit differently. So something I wanna emphasize with the allocations view, the call tree view, which we'll look at shortly here, and the functions view is you're kind of looking at similar data. It's just grouped a little bit different. It's kind of like a slightly different pivot table, if you will. So in the case of the, of the functions view, we have the process ID up top. And then within that, we have different modules. And then within modules, we have specific functions. Now, I had a function in mind that I was interested in. And so we actually have this search bar here. So I'm going to post um, generate primes in here and hit enter. And so now it's going to bring me straight to that function of interest. And when I come to this function of interest, if I expand this particular node, um, I see all of the top allocation types for this specific function. And so right. um, we have like 
the total allocations for this specific function. We see the self allocations, which is the amount of allocations that just this one function is doing. Total is including this what this function generates and all of its children. Um, and then we also have the self size in bytes, so the actual amount of memory. But if we dig into the, the types before, once again, we see, OK, ellipse is the top. There's a lot of ellipses being generated uh, within this function. But if we look at this a little bit more, Leslie, there are other types that are also allocating in quite high quantities, like even more so than the ellipse, right? So we yeah. have 30,000 colors being allocated yeah, and 30,000 <laughs> color, color, color brushes being allocated. And they don't take up quite as much memory as the ellipse, but they still take up a sizable amount, right? Over mm -hmm. a million bytes for each of these. And so now that with this information in mind, I kind of want to go back to source code and say, hey, let, let's look at that function again, but not so much focus on the ellipse, but other of these types. And maybe there are other optimizations to be had. And you know, if we optimize this, even though it wasn't the top type, it's still you know memory we're being we're saving. So I want to go back to the source code. And so I can do that by right clicking and saying go to source file. And I have the code up. So I'll just go back here. And as we're looking at this code again, if we look at this for loop more closely. So yes, we're creating an ellipse for each iteration, but we're also filling it with a specific color. And that color is actually not changing. But based on the way we have this implemented, we're creating oh. another solid color brush object each time, even though this is just, in this case, this is the color of yellow. And yeah. in the case of the prime fill color, we had it green. So we're creating another solid color brush object and, and making that green. But we're creating a new object each time in this for loop too, right? Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> right. So in the case of the ellipse, like I was saying before, yes, there are ways if we want to optimize that we could, but it would be a little bit more involved. We probably wouldn't use the ellipse class. Mm -hmm. But in the case of the fill color, we can actually can do something that. pretty quick here. So what we can do is um, instead, I kind of have the code commented out. But um, mm -hmm. as an example, we could pull out this um, new solid color brush object mm -hmm. and bring it up to a static member right here. And we could assign that to a variable like fill color and then prime fill color in the case of like the yellow and green. And then instead of doing fill equals like this new instance of an object, we just assign it to this static member fill color up here. So that's kind of what I have commented out here. And so I won't um, rerun the code because it, it might take a little while. But basically, uh, if you do that, what you'll see and, and then rerun it like this is that all of those, not all of them, but essentially all of them will go away because we're not necessarily creating a new solid color object every single time for every iteration of the for loop. We just have that static member that we declare at the top and that's not changing. And then we just reference it each time um, within the for loop and it just gets uh, painted that particular color. Yeah, and so that will, that will save us a lot of allocations because if we come back to the functions view, right? Like this function alone um, had 30,000 plus allocations of both color and solid color brush and over a million bytes each. So a lot of all of that will kind of go away essentially. Um, and so uh, something I want to point out here is that um, the, the nature of the investigation, I mean, it's kind of up to you to figure out what you want to optimize, right? Like maybe you do want to optimize and go after the top mm -hmm. um, frame, which was ellipse in this case. But as you pointed out, the code change might be more uh, expensive or more involved, right? And so it's ultimately up to you to figure out what's worth your time and, and what yeah. the trade-off is. But in the case of color and solid color brush, right, that's that's a quick win and it's still only going to help your application. So I mm -hmm. uh, just wanted to point that out. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the theme for a lot of profiling investigations like that, right? Like ultimately it's like, okay, how badly do you want to uh, fix this perf if it means having to modify your code in a way that maybe doesn't make sense depending on the context, so. Totally, and like in the business world, we have to deal with, in software development, you have to deal with these trade-offs all the time, right? Yeah. And so ultimately, you know, on the profiling team, what we're trying to show you is just data and, and insights into what how your application is actually performing. What you want to do with that data ultimately is up to you. Um, but yeah, yeah, you'll have to like ultimately decide where you want to spend the time and, and what's what's worth it. So, Not that it's been quoted a bajillion times already, but with great power comes great responsibility. Great responsibility. <laughs> exactly. So kind of talked about a little bit before how we're kind of showing you different pivots on similar data between the allocations, functions, and call tree view. And so now I kind of want to dig into that third view, the call tree view. And we kind of alluded to it earlier, uh, Leslie, with the expand hot path feature. And so um, 
what the call tree view is showing you is just what are the code pathways that are allocating the most amount of memory. So with the allocations view, you're filtering by kind of like a specific data type or like object type. With the functions view, maybe you have a specific function you want to really drill down into and say, OK, I'm interested in this function across the entire time span. Or if you're using the swim lane filtered down time span, what are all the allocations happening here? The call tree view is just saying, OK, like maybe I'm not interested or focused on a specific object type yet, or I'm not specific on a focused on a specific function yet, but what are just the code pathways? Just show me the path that you know a lot of allocations are happening. And so one thing you can do with the uh, call tree view is kind of expand nodes individually. But as we alluded to earlier, uh, what I would recommend people do is start at like a node of interest and use the expand hot path feature. So what this is doing is essentially showing you where most of your allocations are happening for a given path. So to kind of walk through some of the metrics in this view again, so at any given node, we have the total amount of allocations happening. So that's all the allocations at this particular frame and then all of its children. We have um, self allocations, which is all the allocations just at this particular level. So this is native, but like if we wanted to look at main, for example, main is allocating eight different things. Um, and then we have the bytes in terms of that, in terms of memory, not in terms of the number of objects, but in terms of the memory. And then we have the module name, which is essentially showing what module that function is associated with. And sometimes it'll be associated with multiple modules. Um, and so if uh, what, the, what the expand hot path algorithm is essentially doing is saying, hey, as we're walking down this, if there's a lot of self allocations happening within total allocations, that means you should go into the next function and dig into that a little bit more because that function is contributing to a lot of allocations. And so I kind of started it up here and then used expand hot path. And so what it brings us down to is essentially um, two things. One is this, uh, let me expand this out a little bit more, this generate button click method, which is a certainly allocating a lot of memories because that's the button that's essentially triggering that visualization. Yeah. And then also this allocations frame. So kind of walking through each of these two individually. So the allocations frame, is saying, hey, at this particular node right above it, so in this case, it would be um, like application.run, uh, system.windows, what are all of like the top allocations happening for this particular method? So similar to the functions view, but it's specific to this particular call tree and call path, right? And that's something important to, to denote because there are functions in the call tree view as well as functions in the functions view. So someone might ask like, what's the difference? The difference is the functions in the functions view is looking at the data all up. So it's kind of combining um, the functions across all the times it's being called and kind of add, adding the allocations across all types within that. The call tree view is looking at a specific call stack, right? So um, like any given function might be called many ways. And if we drill down into like these different nodes, like you'll see a lot of the same um, functions being called multiple times, but it's showing you each different iteration of a specific um, like call stack. And so something you can see in the hot pass is the specific allocations for a node of interest. Also, it will sometimes end with another function to look at. Um, and I started the hot path from this highest node. Something to note is you can really start at any level you want. Like, let's say I wanted to look at the generate primes function. I can start the hot path here, too. And it'll show me the allocations or other UI, you know, external calls that are happening as well. So yeah, this is just another view, another pivot on that data. And it's allowing you to kind of go through the call trees and ultimately see what code pathways are allocating the most amount of memory. That can be really useful, it seems, for a lot of .NET peeps out there, especially if you're <laughs> dealing with a lot of graphic intensive things like that, uh, like that application with the prime numbers. So, Yeah, and something I want to call out again is, especially in this view, this is a time where you're really probably going to engage some of the time filtering if you're like really interested in garbage collection and you want to see, hey, what were the calls that like, I don't care about necessarily all the functions in the world, but what were the functions being called at this particular time? Yeah. This is when you combine the graphs with this call tree view. Um, again, <laughs> we're improving perf, it's a bit slow, but but it, it'll show up eventually. And yeah, um, you kind of combine those two two views together. Awesome. There it goes. Yep, there it goes. So you mentioned that perf is still a work in progress for this tool. So yep. um, anything else on the roadmap for .NET allocation? Yeah, so this actually segues perfectly into our last view, which is the, the collections view. Um, so let me clear this selection and then go to the collections view. And admittedly, this kind of this view is pretty young right now, and so we kind of want to work on it. 
But essentially, as we alluded to earlier, um, you know, there's there's a limited amount of memory you're, you have to work with, right? And it's a question of how to allocate and manage it best. And luckily, you know, as we mentioned previously, .NET does a good job of having, you know, the garbage collector come through and automatically scan um, the heap portion in particular uh, of the memory and looks at, you know, what are objects that are allocating memory but are not being used and kind of cleaning that up. And so what the collections view shows you is one kind of instances where garbage collection is being occurred. And if I click on a specific uh, like uh, row within this table, I see, first of all, the number of objects that were collected and how many survived. And then we also get our pie charts over here, which kind of shows you the, the top types within each of those garbage collection, like what were the types that went away and what survived. And so, like I said before, um, this view is more in its infancy. Of course, you can also still time filter. You can still see on the graph, like where the, the red bars are occurring. But what we want to do here, and um, we're still kind of working on designs and the best way to bring this out is like, what are the actionable insights from this code? So like, yes, this is showing me a little bit about like where garbage collection is taking place and what are the top objects that are surviving or being collected. But we want to kind of in the future show you more insights all around like, how do you go back to source and what are the optimizations within your code you can do to maybe not have garbage collection happen as often or more efficiently or better. Um, so that's something we want to look at, improving this view as well as also perf with the tool. Yep. Awesome. So many tables to choose from. So it's cool to yeah. keep up options. Great. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of different pivots on the same data. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I like I like options personally, I think. Yeah. Yep. The more customization, the better. Absolutely. Sweet. So thank you so much, Sagar, for sharing the .NET allocation tool. So if people want to try this out or learn more about this particular tool, where can they go? Yeah, so uh, we've got docs, as always, with all of our tools. And so, yeah, docs uh, for, for the .NET Alloc tool as well um, are updated. So, yeah, we'll, we'll point you to those documentations and you get some more, more of those details. And if you have any questions, of course, always reach out to us. Awesome. And this is not the end of our profiling series. So what are we going to talk about next time? Yeah, so next time, uh, Esteban is going to cover the .NET Performance Counters tool. So really excited for that one. That is actually our newest tool, if I'm remembering correctly. And so that one that one should be really fun. Great. Well, thanks once again for coming, Sagar. Probably going to see you in the near future. <laughs> Absolutely. Pleasure as always, Leslie. Thanks for having me. Likewise. And until next time, happy coding.